platform is a is a hot technology by Microsoft uh, to do enterprise grade application development. So that's why we decided to have a uh, discussion on this topic today. So so to talk about that and to also talk about the great things that we are doing at Curve Digital on Power Platform, I have in, uh, invited Mike Chappell. So Mike Chappell is my colleague. He is a solution director at Curve Digital UK. Welcome, Mike, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, okay, without wasting much time, guys, so let me jump straight to my question one. And Mike, we would like to understand from you, what is Power Platform and uh, you know, how does this model differ differs from the conventional application development? Um, well, to start with, I think the, you know, the the term power platform kind of describes a whole bunch of different components. So if you're familiar with uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365, um, maybe you called it CRM in the past, people called it customer engagement, you used to have it on-prem. That kind of spawned a whole bunch of utilities and a whole bunch of, kind of processes and procedures, which have now spun off and, and become the power platform. So it creates uh, a, a number of components that enable you to build things quickly, securely, creatively, so it starts with something called the Dataverse. Uh, behind the scenes, secretly, we all know Dataverse is SQL Server, but it's exposed through the, the front end, exposed in a way that makes it really, really easy and quick to deliver kind of secure features. So you design your data, you just type into Dataverse, I want 10 fields, I want username, I want address, I want postcode, you hit save, you have a database. And it's there, and it's logged, and it's audited, and it's secure. Right? Yeah. User access controls everything done out of the box immediately. So the next thing you want to do, you want to, well, I want to I build an app. So I want to build a reactive app, a nice responsive app maybe for, for users in an internal situation. You put on a, something called a model app, uh, you drag and drop your fields in from the dataverse and there you have a form. Yep. Ready? You, you yep. have a view, you can filter, you can you, you effectively, like the old days of access, where you'd create a database within access and you'd yep. create a form for that. Absolutely. It's like that, but on steroids. But And, yeah. and then on top yep. of that, you've got Canvas. Yep. Canvas app, so you we have a need in the building maybe to say, I want to log, I want to be on my phone, I want to go to a certain location and just log something that's happening there. Canvas apps are able to be pushed out to company devices, so mobile phones and tablets. And again, that's it's a little bit more complicated than model, but again, it's, it's drag and drop with simple formulas. We'll come on to low code, I think, in a bit, but low code ways to do things quickly. Um, very popular during lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Across the <laughs> across the continent, I'm sure, Absolutely. when organizations had to react quickly to a very unexpected and sudden situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, within Power Platform, you've got Power BI, which I don't think needs much introduction, but yeah, that's absolutely. part of there, and something called Power Pages. Yes. Um, so Power Pages, are, I've talked about Canvas and model, mostly internal, mostly you know company-wide things. So Power Pages might be if you need an external interface quickly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a trustee of a charity back in England that runs a theatre. Yeah. Um, and we very quickly needed to have a way for patrons to pay for drinks because in England you weren't allowed to go to the bar and buy drinks. Yeah. We had to stay two meters apart. Yeah. So uh, one weekend, with the help of someone else not very far away, we knocked out uh, a power page wow. uh, in one weekend that would allow people to order drinks from a catalog stored in Dataverse, pay for them on PayPal, and deliver them to the seats. Now, sadly, the power page didn't do the delivery part. We still have to do that. Yeah. But yeah. It, it was that kind of speed and the ability to react that I think Power Platform yeah. has really opened up. But it's so familiar because it's using concepts like from Dynamics or yeah. from Excel or from places that yes. users and developers are very familiar with. Absolutely. I think I think to summarize, guys, I, what I will say, it sets you up for the rapid application development, right? You, you, you don't need expensive softwares to install on your machines, all you need is the right subscription from Microsoft, and uh, you're all set. I mean, you you can just you know have any kind of you can connect to any kind of data with a user interface of your choice, and within minutes you can have an enterprise ready you know production ready application. I know I, I'm sounding like super simple, but in some use cases it is right. Mm -hmm. You can quickly create a quick application. All right, that's that's a great start. So um, you know coming. To my second question, which is for our developer community. So, Mike, I'm a .NET developer, right? I've done a lot of C# -sharp, uh, application development, you know, in my career. Now, how does the landscape look for me? Uh, what are my opportunities? I think if you uh, come from a traditional kind of engineering background, C# -sharp .NET, um, what you're going to find when you move into Power Platform is the the things that used to take you a long time, mm -hmm. and the things, forgive me for saying, that maybe you found boring, <laughs> uh, they're kind of handled for you. So I mentioned earlier about you know 
as an app dev in the old days, creating that interface to the database, constantly arguing with the database administrator about how you're going to run things and whether it's going to be set based and so on and so forth. That is kind of all gone away. So immediately you stop worrying about how do I get to a database? How do I secure it? How do I audit it? How do I make sure I've got logging enabled? All those things that you you spend time on, yep. they just assume they're there, right? They're there in their work. And if they're not how you want, you tick a box and you fix it. So you, you, it forces you to move forward from a, how do I do the mundane elements? How do I do the things I've done a hundred times before? And I'm just copying and pasting and then tweaking. Don't worry about that. It moves you into actually what's the real need of my user, yeah. right? So it enables you to focus more on what's the problem that I'm trying to solve? What's the complexity? And, and, and anyone who's been in engineering or in app dev in the past, you're going to have a problem solving brain, right? Yeah. Most yeah. of you are there because you enjoy solving problems and finding out the fastest way to do things or the best way to do things for a user. You are given a tool set now that unleashes your kind of creative potential to solve those problems. So the, the, the simple bits are done, the copy and paste bits, they're done. Don't worry about those. Actually, how do I move a user from this kind of relatively complicated use case? I need to now make that simpler for them. Yep. So you, your brain gets to focus on those kinds of problems. Yep. Um, and again, you know, we talk about no code, low code. I have opinions on that. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, there will always be a situation where as an app dev, Yep. And you have that extensive background when it does get to that complicated thing that you, you just need to shell out and write some code for. Yep. You're able to do that and you embed it back in again. So we, we talk about that PCF controls or yep. elements that if you want to do something that no, if you want to do something that is very common, those bits are easy. If you want to do something amazing and creative that no one's ever done before, you probably write a custom element of code yep. and they are going back to you know pro code then. Yep. Um, but when you've done that, you're probably pushing that back out to your community. Whether that be we in Curve Digital, for example, we push that out to our local community where we work with government clients, we put it out to GitHub and make it available to everyone. Yeah. So you've got that, you know, other people who aren't so great at code have got that ability to draw down on it and use it in their own apps. Right. Okay. Unless you want to keep it secret. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think I think .NET and C sharp developers out there, right? I think mm -hmm. I mean C sharp still has some serious presence in the game, guys. Uh, uh, you know. If you talk about data was the, all the plugins that we write are still in C sharp on the model driven app. We do a lot of scripting work. So yeah, I mean, ground is covered. I mean, it, it, I think it will be a natural extension to your existing skill set. Mm -hmm. You don't have to unlearn anything to learn new thing. I think you can easily build on your exi existing skill set, right? Yeah, the, the principles are, are sound and the uh, same. Sound. So it's speed you, you can go at that is so that, changed. That begs us the next question, right? Mike, where do I start? Like I'm like I said, I'm a .NET developer. Now I want to start Power Platform. What's my what's the baby step I, I take or what's the step one that I should take? Um it depends on the kind of learner you are, I okay. suppose. But so for me, I'm I'm very much I learn by doing. Yeah. So yeah. I would I would go out and so you can create a demo environment. Yeah. So if, if, I, I think it's at home done that. Is this still at home.dynamics.com? We'll find out. We'll, we can put a link out there. Yeah. But you can create a demo is. environment. Sorry? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, good. My memory is not too terrible. <laughs> um, if you've got an office license, you probably already have some yes. of the capabilities in yes. there. Yes. If, if you haven't or you do, you know, you're in a situation where you don't want to, you know, say you're in a, a work tenant and you want to play a little bit, then you can create your own home demo environment. That gives you somewhere to experiment and play. Yeah. Um, and there's, I, I don't think there's... I shouldn't maybe say this in a recorded thing, but I don't think there's a limit to how many times you can take out a demo. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you get to play a lot. Uh, and if it's being renewed every 30 days, yeah. then that just forces you to be good at saving things. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I, I, I can also heartily recommend Microsoft Learn. So there was a time where, you know, forgive me, Microsoft, Microsoft Learn wasn't the most amazing resource, right? You would you would go away and you'd get external training to, yeah. to try and up your game or you'd yes. spend a lot of time on YouTube. Yep. Microsoft Learn is actually really good now. Yes. So there's a course called uh, PL200. It's not yep. the best named course, but a course called PL200. That will take you through, I believe, the, the basics up to a reasonable level of each kind of component or power platform. Right. And it does so in a, a kind of guided way. So it present, you know, this module is going to be on on how to build a canvas app and it was talking through the basics and and each step is two or three minutes long and maybe the longest one is 10 15 minutes yeah. so it's something you can easily achieve whenever you've got a free moment you know we've all got busy lives yeah. but it's something you can get yeah. through easily um but also the community is is huge um if you look up power platform community there's probably a use group near you yeah. there's probably uh, a youtuber you, you might recognize or certainly some you know big names out there that have their own youtube channels that talk through this there are some 
yeah. even with our own company. I won't plug them specifically, yeah. just in case I forget one. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah, we have marks of um, yeah, we have MVPs within with Curve Digital have their own yeah. platforms as well. So, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. So, like Mike said, right? We, there are plenty of resources on on Microsoft Learning and you know certification learning, and you can explore that. All right, I think good, great conversations going on, guys. I hope you're with us. So my next question, Mike, right? You, you, we talked a lot about code, C sharp, TypeScript, JavaScript. Now, and you said low code, no code. What is that, man? What I mean, what is low code? Are we done with the coding? No, uh, no I don't think we're done with the coding. Um, I don't think we'll be done with the coding. <laughs> I love coding. I, um, I've been doing some this morning, and even though in my role I don't get to do it very often, having 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 a lovely time in India, I have a lot of free time when my colleagues aren't awake today, so I've actually managed to get some done. Um, I think, yeah, no code is definitely a thing. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a thing that most of the people in this call would necessarily be interested in, but we'll quickly talk through that. Yeah. Um, so if you have a simple need that has been done before and there is a template for, mm -hmm. so I think during COVID there was room booking, if you need to come into the office, oh, yeah. when that was an unusual thing, mm -hmm. there was a template and you could effectively say next, 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 my company name is this, yeah. my rooms are this, this is how I want to do, and you, you hit save, and that would generate a simple, fairly bland looking but working app working that you could then push actually. out to your inventory and, and that's that use case is really really good for a whole bunch of people i think for this call you're probably not interested in that you're probably interested in what the difference between low code and pro code is yeah. Yeah. um so i think in the scenarios we're talking about there's probably never a no code environment if, it, if it's a no code thing Absolutely. curve don't really need to be involved we can advise but we don't need to build anything low code is is going to be familiar so there's a, there's a language or expression feature set called yep. um, PowerFX. PowerFX yes. And then what that builds on is, you know, if you're old enough like me to have remembered Access, but most people remember Excel, you know, your if statement structures yep. will be familiar, your, your, your ways of interacting with things and drawing in, it's, it's effectively a simple kind of language that enables you to say, take this data. So I'm gonna connect to, um, I'm gonna connect to Dropbox. So every time there's a, a, a change in a Dropbox file, I want to reference that and display yeah. that back into my app. Yeah. Then you can do that with one line of code, collect the information from Dropbox, and then you maybe place that into a variable, and then a variable you put into a grid view yeah. in your in your Canvas app, yeah. and suddenly all you have to do is, is then publish that app, and with that one line of code, you're querying Dropbox and pushing the information back into an app. Absolutely, user. And, and talk about integrations, right? I remember, you know, with, Power, with the arrival of Power Platform, integrations I don't think have been, you know, have never been so easy, right? I remember, you know, we, you know, we wrote a Power Platform, Power Automate code, you know, in our last project, it was listening, and monitoring a tweet box, Twitter account. As soon as we received the tweet, it it sent it for the sentiment analysis without writing any code. Then, once we received the sentiment score, we sent it for case creation dynamics again without writing any code. Then, when then you know based based on you know the sentiment score again we were sending it to a third party api for the grievance redressal mechanism to log a grievance in their external system again without writing any code so i don't think if in the pre pre low code world if you would ask me to give an estimate of that probably i would give a large estimate yeah. right so uh, that's a few I mean, points that was yeah. A, yeah so it's a magic i would sometimes it really feels like magic you're not writing any any not, not a single line of code but still you know able to manage a lot of work done i mean that's amazing all right great things going on all right so now let's move on to our next question which is around the work that we are doing at Curve digital so mike would you like to talk to us about the the work that we are doing on power platform what are we doing so yeah so um we've got a, well we've got a, a large number of clients but each of them have different needs depending on their maturity depending on where they are in the kind of their journey into this space mm -hmm. so um we found some clients so I, I spoke to i won't name them because you know I, <laughs> i'll be careful uh, but i spoke to one client recently and they had during lockdown kind of struggled a little bit with their it capabilities because people couldn't come into work the the, the, the capabilities they had had been lessened they kind of jumped in and, and straight away kind of started building canvas and model apps that enabled them to run very significant transport infrastructure um and we we find we have with those clients our job is to come in and they'll have say 20 or 30 apps that they'd like to put out fairly quickly okay. um and then we'll just we'll kind of get on with that we'll go through the user requirements we'll talk to the users we'll sit down with them uh, and one of the beauties about power platform is you no longer have to go away necessarily and, and wireframe things up and 
back and forth on that and scribble them at, you know, and hand them off to a UX person and come back again. You can live screen share yeah. with your end user, the person that wants the app and say, what if it was to look like this? How would you like it to look like that? Oh, I'd like the button to be green, but that's fine. Yeah. That that kind of scenario. And we, we, we get to the point where we can get user stories together in in days and we can be building apps. I think the last one we built, the last complicated one we built, we turned over in six weeks. Oh. Um, Simpler ones, obviously, you know, the integration I wrote this morning when I actually had some free time, it took about 15 minutes to integrate one system in, into a database. Mm -hmm. um, other, other customers that we like, they're a little bit more nervous about you know getting straight into this really fast pace of delivery. Yes. So for them, we're bit, there's something called a center of excellence. Okay. And it's a center of excellence kind of starter toolkit. So we've, we've built some things that enhance that toolkit to make it even more user friendly. But the base one from Microsoft is, is pretty cool. And with them, we're kind of putting that in first. And, and that gives a whole bunch of extra governance and controls. So going back to my point, you don't have to worry about, we don't not worry about it, but don't have to worry so much as developers about how this stuff is governed and controlled. There is toolkits around that. So for them, we put the toolkit in first, and then we'd enable, we might enable their citizen developers to start to build things. And in that instance, we might be supporting those, but more often than not, we're, we're kind of establishing those first use cases. Um, and that goes through, we've done power supply companies, transport companies, charitable organizations. Um, and what we can deliver is, you know, alongside those large business transformations that we're in Curve Digital are most famous for, this uh, whole scale, entire kind of enterprise wide architectural uplifts. Mm -hmm. Alongside that, we can be delivering, oh, and here's an app to locally recognize people. Okay. Oh, and, and here's an app to make sure that we're checking all the forms that are coming back in. So your, your comment earlier about um, having something do sentiment analysis, yeah. that, that's a great example too. Yeah. There are organizations that still run on paper um, and there's a, a room maybe somewhere where they scan in those bits of paper. We'll have Power Platform, you know, read that scanned in document, wow. do the sentiment analysis on it and work out actually this is a complaint should so go over yeah. here. This yeah. is a, a new query, it should go over here. Again, without writing, much code? No, nope, no. Nope. Nope. So the, the code, the code will, the code will come in. But yeah. the code will come in. So uh, a good example was we were trying to do a case management system. So they had that scanned in document. Yeah. They said, "I need help, yeah. and I need help at this address." Mm -hmm. um, and the client there was very specific that they wanted to use a certain addressing technology. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a custom component and dragged and dropped. You know, we wrote that in code. Okay. to use it was google maps um, yeah. we used yeah we, we wrote this specific thing to use google maps and display it in the way the client wanted okay. wrote that in code published that pushed that into the power platform dragged that into the form so they were going through their case flow process wow. saying i've got this query from this person and the, the user obviously that's brilliant but i can't really visualize that and there's that custom component yeah. that visualizes them yes. no you know, wrench in the journey no confusion to the user and then they go on to the next stage yeah. i should point out bing you get out of the box they particularly went to google great we have built some accelerators haven't we yes that's a great point so going back to my you know the earlier suggestion that not many devs like to do the same thing again and again and again we yeah. we noticed that uh, and so that, that's one of the reasons I think there's, there's a few good reasons why we do this. So one is no dev likes to write the same thing a hundred times. Yep. Uh, it gets boring yep. um, <laughs> and we don't like to be bored, certainly yep. not in this organization. Neither. So you know, there's, there's logic in having these common components that right. we can put together. But also um, we work a lot, you know, the, the man, mantra, the mandate, what we do as an organization is we try, try and do well, but we try and do it by doing good. Yep. So if we're working with charities, which we do a lot, or, or yes. central government organizations where, yes. you know, they're improving safety of the, of the countries, yep. um, we don't like to charge for things which we've already done. Okay. What we'd like to do is kind of deliver what we already know they're going to need up front, maybe tweak it a bit, okay. uh, but deliver what they need up front and say, right, let's start, let's not start from the bottom. Yes. Let's start from, you know, good percentage of the way in. Yes. And then we can work on the things that your use case yep. Is, yep. Is, is more particular to. So we, yep. we call those accelerators. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we mentioned about uh, Center of Excellence Accelerator. Yeah. So out of the box, Center of Excellence will allow you to find all the you know all the artifacts created by people who've left the organization. Wow. And we'll warn you about that. And that's great because yes. you, you now know, yes. hang on a minute, Mike wrote this really cool app this morning and then he left, you know, yes. flew back to England and never was seen again, hopefully not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if, if I had done that and I hadn't created it in a way with service accounts, I hadn't created it in a, in a way which was sensible, um, that flow at some point or that code at some point was suddenly, you know, when my account got deactivated, maybe not work. 
So yeah. that that's great that we are warned about that out of the box. So the, the curved digital accelerator goes on top of that, says, yes, here's the warning about it, but also here's some things you can do. Here's a button to maybe quarantine the app. Here's a button that takes you away to suggestions around how you can fix this or how you might want to bring this in. So for each of those capabilities that exist, our accelerator will expand it. Yeah. And that's based on having spoken to so many different clients and taking those use cases that we see time and time again and just pushing that there straight off and said, you're bound to want this, so here you go. If they don't want it, that's great. But yeah, mo more often than not, we see people with the same kind of needs again and again. That's what our accelerators are there to support. I have seen some of the accelerators, if not all, and I think it's a beautiful mix of, you know, low code and pro code approaches and it's extensible right we can we can, we can extend it expand it it's extensible you know you can have more solutions baked in so yeah i mean the, the people out there who love to code like me it's 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 there i mean please please yeah the feature requests is the moment you put an accelerator into yeah. organization suddenly they realize what's possible yes those feature requests are coming straight after Super, super good. So, guys, I think it's it's going great. And that brings me to the next question, which is everyone's favorite topic today, chat GPT. Ah. Because ever since it has arrived on the horizon, guys, it has sent some massive shock waves to the to the fabric of technology, right? And everyone is feeling it, Mike. So what do you think about it? Is AI replacing humans? No, no. And it's not, to my knowledge, creating robots either. At least not yet. Um, no, I, I see chat GPT. So we've been speaking, you know, for a, a number of years now. At the beginning of the year, we, we'd all talk about what our strategy and vision for the year is yeah. and what we think the big tech advancements are going to be. And we've been saying AI for a while now. Um, I yeah. A little bit kind of, well, what's the real oh, use yeah. case I'm for not this? Fearful. Um, but now I am. Now I am. <laughs> yeah, well, no. So, you know, I can give some great examples in a minute. I'll just talk about Microsoft. Obviously, they've invested, what, 10 billion? Yep. I think 10 billion in OpenAI, the kind of the, the creators of the brains behind ChatGPT. Um, we could talk about Bard, but we won't. This is Microsoft. Um, and they, they, they've already embedded those into uh, Office, or sorry, Microsoft 365 and Power Platform things. So, in Microsoft 365, my my favorite feature which is coming is uh, if for whatever reason you're late to a meeting, oh, yeah. not that I would ever do that, but if forever I was late to a meeting, it will, it will ping me in Teams and it'll say, notice you're uh, 10 minutes late to this meeting wow. with, three, with three items into the agenda, um, you know, and Paddy said this uh, and, and Rob said that, uh, the next thing you might want to cover off is this. So I get that kind of prompt. Wow. Or if I'm scanning it as a huge Word document, it might summarize that into a paragraph for me because I'm a lazy, lazy man yeah. and I just want to read the summary. So that that's going to exist in Microsoft. Six, well, it does exist in Microsoft 365, and it, it's rolling out accordingly. But in Power Platform, um, we often do these things where there's a big whiteboard behind us. So maybe maybe we draw up yeah. an idea of oh, how yeah. we might want something to look. Yeah, where that's you, cool. Yeah, wow. take a photo of it. Create an app. Create an app. Take a photo of it, create an app, and then all you have to do is worry about the wiring. And it yeah. will do the wiring for you, and it'll yeah. probably get it a reasonable amount correct, but it's not replacing devs. It's yes. doing the boring bit. Yeah. The devs still have to go through and, and, and check that actually, yeah, okay, on the face of it, that's great. Here's where the complexity comes in and yeah. take it forward from that. But it, it's also a really useful tool. So we, talk, you know, we haven't talked about Copilot, but Copilot exists for devs, right? Yeah. Um, you can go into you can go into it and say, oh, um, could you knock me out a, a button that calls JavaScript to do you know make the suddenly change the screen to green? Yeah. I don't know why you do that, but yeah, <laughs> you could do that. I, I was um I was in earlier when I was doing this thing earlier, and I had I, I'd called an API and I'd got a response back in in Flow, mm -hmm. and it sent me a JSON back with you know all the fields, and I thought ah those are the fields I want to store in the database. I am too lazy to write a create table statement. Yeah, I've been doing this for twenty something years. I, so yeah. I just asked ChatGPT, here's the JSON, create me, a, create me a create table statement. Here you are, here's a TSQL, here's an insert statement. Yeah. Maybe you want to consider these indexes. Yeah. Great, copy, paste, that bit's done. Yeah. So there, there's a whole bunch of ways in which it's going to make us quicker. Uh, the estimate is you know, developers will, who use Copilot and, and similar tools will probably get a 20% uplift in their, in their ability. Um, mm -hmm. yep. Yep. I think, again, it takes away some of the, the mundane elements, you know, the, the boring elements that... Uh, it's always worth checking. Don't just copy and paste and fly with it because, you know, it's still relatively preview. I um, yeah. <laughs> you look in and, yeah, it, it, it's learned from a really capable source. Um, but, oh, yeah, my, my word to the wise, always double check before you hit commit or hit F5. Yep. Um, 
and it, and it is there and it will take us forward but it it, it isn't a creative human being right yeah. it is not gonna yes. it'll do exactly what it's told yeah. and it'll do it in a really kind of capable way yeah. uh, and it might suggest some other things that you want to do afterwards but yeah. what it and only based on what other people have done before yeah. it can only learn it, it's not creating so we're there to be the creators we're there to have the ideas we're there to, to to be the kind of imaginative person that solves the problem it's there to do the legwork yeah yeah if that makes sense absolutely i i will give uh, the audience my little hack with chat gpt so in one of my projects i you know i was doing some documentation and i really needed a lot of you know diagramming work and then i asked chat, chat gpt hey you know can you give me the mermaid script for oauth flow and within within you know the blink of an eye, the whole mermaid script was there. I just copied, pasted, and there was a beautiful OAuth diagram generated. So yes, I mean, the the text generation has gone to a new different level altogether. It, it did my ERD for me. Find it out and plant URL. You plant UML. Yeah, yeah. A bit of paste that to draw IO. There's my ERD well, drawn well, for me. Failed. Thank you very much. It failed for me when I tried to generate the plant UML, but that that is. We'll do that. Side. We're having a session. Yeah. Anyone in the building? We'll work that one out next. <laughs> All right, guys, I think I'm enjoying, I'm yeah. loving the conversation and hope you guys too are. So, so next question, Mike, we want to, I want to talk about <clears throat> the work that we do at Curve Digital and the great team that we have. So would you like to talk to us about the great technology team at Curve Digital for our audience? Yeah, certainly. So we are, <laughs> the Curve Digital are, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but we are a bunch of geeks, right? So our founder used to be, a, you know, our founders were developers. Uh, and salespeople, our chief executive officer used to write PHP. You know, we, we, we've come from a very kind of technical background. Um, you know, if you if you watch us on any of the Teams calls, you'll probably see a whole bunch of fairly geeky stuff behind us as well. We're, we're all into in, into our technology and the techno. So the technology team in a technology company, yeah. we are we are definitely all about the latest and greatest. Yeah. So I, I mentioned it a moment ago, but when we are done here, we, we are going over to that room over there and we're going to work out how we can embed chat GPT into, into flows, which is part yes. of the Power Platform, I forgot to mention. Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's, I think, do you want to talk about the structure of it or the wider organization or the clients? Yeah, I mean, or... what do we do? Do we only do Power Platform or do no, the other no, technologies? No, also? no so yeah, sorry, that's a really important point. So yes, we are very much into Power Platform because okay. uh, we love it because of the speed we get to deliver things for our clients. Yes, yes. Um, we're also into Dynamics. So, you know, the, the first, what we call the first party apps still technically you know, power platform uh but we also we do our erp so business central mm -hmm. another microsoft yes. product we, we we're heavily involved with kind of dynamics and business central and how they integrate and how they can part of that digital transformation i alluded to is, is you often need a, a number of different SaaS tool sets or pass tool sets yeah. in order to transform a business um massively into data science mm -hmm. So you know, one of the exciting things, and you know, obviously, what ChatGPT trained on is yeah. really significant data sets, really cool kind of expansive data transformation projects. Yeah. Organizations are really, really good. We find that capturing data not necessarily as mature or amazing, actually getting results out of it. Yeah. We talk about data lakes or people talk about data swamps. Yeah. Uh, a, a good part of our business is about how to make that data more intelligent. And there's a whole bunch of tools that we use with Microsoft. Uh, that enable us to expose that inf information in a much more meaningful way, train AI models, et cetera, that you know, can deliver outcomes for customers. And we do the, the more traditional stuff as well. So there are a, you know, a good portion of us here yep. who do still just, you know, I say just right, yep. that code, yep. right? It's <laughs> like they're, they're outside of Power Platform where you do need to pro code extend it. There are people who you know, just do pro dev code. So we might yep. be building a, a specific uh, app for phones that you know it's not for a Microsoft organization because not all our customers are fully embedded in Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole range of different things we do. Right. Right. I just get excited about Power Platform. Talk about customer service, Mike. I mean, do you think there is a tectonic shift in the way we are doing customer service using Power Platform and with the large language models? What do you think? Um, I don't think we've necessarily realized it as yet, but if, if you think about what the, the these large language models can do and the learning you can have with them. So uh, picture a situation where you, you have a very large organization that gets thousands of queries a day and it's just not yes. staffed up to cope with those. It's maybe a charity that- Like you, chatbots doing self-service without you know needing a real agent. Yeah, yeah. So you, you would have um, very similar requests coming through. You've probably got a website somewhere that details actually the answers that people can't read 
or are too lazy to read or for whatever reason they're not yeah. self-serving they're coming through you can hook that up to those, those language models yes, yes. Um, so microsoft have embedded it's called viva for customer yes. service yeah. um and it can kind of scan through what the user is saying it's already scanned absorbed and aggregated the, the the content of the the user guides if you like that domain knowledge that exists within the client mm -hmm. and it can you could either if you're very brave say just automatically respond to my customers for me, which a lot of chatbots do now. Mm -hmm. But I don't know about you, but I've been on quite a few websites where the chatbot has really not understood what I'm saying because yeah. if, if I was had a simple query, I wouldn't need to get yeah. in contact with you. That's the kind of person I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with these extended language models, it actually will read intent in much more effectively yes. and be much better at supplying back the correct answer. Or yeah. if you're an, an organization, and we, and we know them, that are a little bit more nervous about kind of that kind of thing, you can still have a human involved. Mm -hmm. And that human, instead of being able to deal with one or two individuals at a time, maybe can do 10 saying, that looks right, that looks right, that looks right. And yeah. you know, it's not having to do the typing. It, he, she is not having to do the typing. Yeah. Um, it's just you know correcting responses where they're not amazing or just yeah. saying, yes, I believe also that's that's what the user is intending. And that will evolve. Like we mentioned earlier, this is, a very fast evolving landscape. We yes. went from 3.5 to 4 in chat GPT terms very quickly. Yes. Um, and it will continue to go so. Absolutely. I, I think they're also talking about training these, you know, pre-built models on customers' data so that now it can answer the questions in the customer's context instead of, yeah. you know, general <clears throat> knowledge that it has. Yeah, and then that kind of uh, specific training you, you've always been able to train I say always but you know, in the last few years you've been able to train custom AI models you can go into Azure go to cognitive services yes. say here's my data please train it and then you can correct it and it can learn from that uh, if you're going for if you wanted chat GPT but you wanted it more specific or you wanted one of those other models yeah. you you can you can absolutely train them through the Microsoft capabilities at the moment um, you'll see there's organizations, and, and some of you guys might uh, be working for them, there's some nervousness around the open chat GPT, so mm -hmm. just go to chat.openai.com and, and firing new queries, because it's learning from that data. Yep. So if you're putting yep. commercially sensitive information in there, mm -hmm. you aren't specifically publishing it, but what you're yep. doing is you're putting it into an open domain where a bot is learning from it. So yep. if you were to put in there saying, Mike gets paid you know, 50 rupees an hour, um, and then someone else in another part of the world said, how much does, does Mike get paid? There's yes. a chance yes. that it might have learned yeah. that and it, and yes. it responds back to Absolutely. it. So what Microsoft are able to do because of that investment in OpenAI mm -hmm. is to create these specific instances mm -hmm. of these models that you can utilize within, like call it a sandbox maybe, within your own kind of walled garden and say, here is all my company's data. Here's all my company's information about yes. how to approach these things. Yes. Don't share that Don't with the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, but please share it within my tenant, within my organization, and enable me to get some benefit out of that. And I can choose whether to expose it. For example, we could embed it into Power Pages and expose it externally if we chose to. Yeah. But more often than not, it's going to be to make our internal uh, operations Operation that much more efficient yes. and, and quicker. Yes, absolutely right, guys. So we talked about data, right, Mike? So, you know, the the dynamics implementations are getting complex and complex these days and there is a requirement of massive data warehousing in dynamics how, how do you think power platform supports that um if you're going so the first thing is there's still that four terabyte limit before you before you get too carried away and push everything into that yes. uh, and there's costs associated with that depending on what licenses you have yes. but i think you know, in many instances we we have seen that you you will have your operational data, your day-to-day, -day, what you're working on, what you're doing inside of Dynamics. Mm -hmm. And you, you might have, so some organizations I'm working with recently, they have casework that can take a long period of time to come. So they're gonna keep maybe two years worth of case handling information within Dynamics. Mm -hmm. But at the point where they're kind of, well, we don't, we're not actively working this stuff anymore, but we yeah. need it for reporting. We need year on year, exactly that. So you, you, go into, you go into your workspace, you go to make, and you say, I'd like to put this information somewhere cheaper. Yeah. Sorry, Microsoft, but it definitely isn't the cheapest place to store data inside <laughs> Dynamics. So I'd like to put this somewhere cheaper, but really accessible mm -hmm. and really easy to query for the users, the very specific users that I see it. Right. And it is as simple as creating a, uh, this, somewhere there's a YouTube video of me getting this very wrong. It's hilarious. You work in the end. Um, but you can go in and you can create a a, a Synapse Analytics workspace, you yep. can create storage as your jobs are yes. very cheap places to store data. Yes. And you say, 
did dear database yeah the database we took, please put a blob and stick Absolutely. synapse on top of it so for me you're a sql guy old i can go into i can query you know, bits of information that you used to be in database yes um, and some of it might still happily. be aggregated sitting happily still in the cloud still within my safe tenants still only accessible to the right people but I, I can now aggregate you know years worth of information really really quickly yes. and i'll probably on top of that so that you know the executives can see it in a graph absolutely so guys we are we are approaching towards the tail end of our conversation but mike you said we have we are now able to manage large amounts of data in dynamics and data was right using a azure synapse analytics so then what do i do with data if we you know add power bi to the equation uh, well, you put Power BI on the top, and what you've done is actually democratize your data. Yes. I don't know if that term means anything to everybody. Sorry. So what you do is you you make it accessible to everyone. So I can write SQL. We can probably in this room probably a lot of us can write SQL. Yes. Um, some of us can write even more clever stuff. Yeah. Um, I can't, my big data days are a bit behind me now. Um, but that's not necessarily what your boss is going to want to do. That's not what um, your end users are going to want to do. Yeah. But they are going to need to benefit from that data. Yeah. So it, it is as simple now as saying, dear Power BI, here is the data that I have in Synapse. Along with that, it, on the process of moving it from Dataverse into Synapse, it's discovered all the metadata, all the information that describes the data. Power BI can draw on that. Mm -hmm. And you can say, uh, I'd like a graph of how many cases have been submitted day by day for the last three years, yes. drag, drop, there's the information. Yep. And you can publish that and you can push that out. You can either embed it back into Dynamics or into the Power, Wide Power Platform, or maybe you've got a very specific MI department, the Business Intelligence Department, that has a whole bunch of other reports in there. And you can just take that kind of universal resource that Power BI will create for you and embed that in your wider reporting system. Mm -hmm. and so when I say democratize the data, what I'm, I'm meaning is you're making the learnings that you get from having this much information about your customers available to all the people that could need it. You don't necessarily have to give them details, but you can, you can give them that kind of wider vision that enables those people who make the decisions, the SMEs, the leaders, to immediately understand, ah, things have changed. I need yeah. to react to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that was a great discussion, Mike, and thank you very much for that. I think what we understood today from our conversation is that Power Platform is indeed a great, great, you know, technology for building enterprise grade applications. It has, you know, you know, large data processing capabilities. It has integrations available using low code, no code approaches. There are there are flavors available for the pro code, pro code uh, developers out there. And I think it has got ground covered for pretty much every one of us. So I think that that was a great learning. And I I hope guys you enjoyed this discussion today and. We leave the floor open for any Q and A now. I think. Okay, so we've got a few in there. Have we got any favourites from inside the room, or should we yeah, just we, start we, to go through the list? Mean, we've got a few minutes, haven't we? Yeah, we have got a lot of questions. So let me. I I'll pull the mic <laughs> up a little bit closer. My eyes aren't that good. So the first one about, yeah, can you please share some information about how secure the data is? Um, um, yeah, I think that that's yes. a great question yes. and one that a lot of our clients have. Yes. Yes. Um, Dataverse is as secure as you want it to be, right? So out of the box, the only person you create an environment, you create a tenant, the only person that's going to have access to that Dataverse is you. Mm -hmm. um, if you then want to extend upon that mm -hmm. and you want to make it available to more people, there is a very large amount of features that you can utilize yep. that enable you to do that. So a simple scenario might be, I want to share all the records in this table with my team and your team might be defined in Active Directory. So sure, just just you know, link, in, link to that team in Active Directory and say yep. everyone in that team can see these, these rows. You can expand upon that. You can have teams with business units on top of them. You can have specific security roles. Yep. So my security role might say I can see all the information except for the payroll table. Yeah, yep. very wise. Um, or you might say that someone else can see only the payroll table because there's no need for them to understand you know, what's happening in the, in the case management workload. So you, you can define security roles, assign security roles to users and teams, yeah. assign those up to business units. You can have a managerial hierarchy. Yeah. So you could automatically say that anyone in a senior position can see anything within their business units automatically yeah. without having to add them into all those teams. Yeah. Or you might decide that's a bit too risky and you're going to stick with just the team structure. So I think the the possibilities are, are almost limitless. I mean, I've done this for some some very big banks, and they have some very tight requirements. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've never struggled to build a really kind of 
um, solid security model, uh, which is observable, well, which means it's, it's easy to look at. I, mean, I think the most yep. important thing about security after a little while is understanding who still has access, because yep. you, you don't want hidden hierarchies, yep. um, and auditable. So if, yep. if someone suddenly has permissions and you, you didn't realize that you know, how, the, how the hell have they got to that record, you can find out that it was me. I granted them access to that record, and you can come and find me and say, absolutely. why? <laughs> yes, absolutely. How that and, answers your question. So go. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would just like to add, uh, you know, one more point, you know, it has, you know, security, you know, at its core, you know, you have data encryption at risk, you have data encryption during transit, you have multi-factor authentication, you have role-based security. So you, I think from the security perspective, I think I find Power Platform Dataverse is one of the, you know, you know, most powerful platforms out there. All right, that was a good question. Now we move on to next question, which is, all right, how does Power Platform integrate with other Microsoft products like Dynamics 365? Yep, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, much of it is what we call out of the box, and I'm conscious I didn't really explain what that meant. So that means that there yes. are uh, effectively drag and drop components that allow you to do things. Yep. So I talk, we talked about Dynamics earlier, that case work we put, let's say, customer service enterprise, Dynamics yeah. 365 customer service enterprise. You install that for a client and you and you have case workers going through that. That's brilliant. You have an additional use case, which is, say, for field workers yeah. to be able to submit evidence that goes back into that case management yes. system. Yes. They don't need Dynamics. All they're doing is driving around the country, yeah. finding out specific facts yeah. and feeding that back to the casework handlers. Yeah. So yeah. what you might do then is create a Canvas app yeah. and have that Canvas app maybe take a photo of the evidence that you need and press a button within the Canvas app and have that push back to blob storage or SharePoint or wherever you, you choose to put it. Yep. Um, that can then be exposed directly in Dynamics. So yep. there, you're in the same, when you're in the same environment, you can have multiple environments per tenant per organization, yep. but when you're in the same environment, yep. as long as you've got the security kind of restrictions in place and you've thought about that security mm -hmm. and, and those roles that we mentioned earlier, you can absolutely extend Canvas model all those capabilities, Power BI, on that same database. Dataverse sits at the heart of that entire environment, yes. accessible to any Dynamics apps. And mm -hmm. remember, you can have customer service and sales. You put URS in there. You can have all those different first-party apps yeah. on the same database for different use cases, yeah. and then extend that with Power Platform. So actually, these users, we don't need to buy them a full Dynamics license, yeah. and they don't use it very often. We'll get yeah. them a a pay-as-you-go yep. per app plan, yep. pay-as-you-go or power app plan, yep. and you push them out into the field, and off they go. Cheapest way to do it. Yes. Um, doesn't expose information they don't need to see, yep. but does mean that centrally all that stuff is going back into Dynamics because it's the same database. Yes, I think Power Platform touches pretty much all the you know product suit that Microsoft has ever created. You can use you know Power Automate to connect pretty much every you know product Microsoft ever built. You can use connectors for Office to send out emails, connectors for Teams to send out chat messages and whatnot. So I think opportunities, as we just discussed, are, are um, theme there. All I right, like do we one. have? Yeah, should we quick, quick oh. why, why Power Platform oh, yeah. and not Google App Make or Salesforce? Do, oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah I, I want to know it too, man. I yeah, it's better. Place. It's just flatter. <laughs> I'm not going to beat around the try them right yeah so the, the, these capabilities they they push demo environments out there it's really easy to get started in power platform yes. why because we're so confident well microsoft is so confident that it's the right solution yes so, but if, if you you know this is what we do for a living i'm obviously biased go out and try it go and get demo environments those things if you're wondering what to do in your career you can get demo environments out and just see how quickly you can build this stuff how quickly you can extend it invent a use case in your head right so i've got some things i volunteer at yeah. I, I, I've got some use cases I can think of. I try it and I deliver it quickly. I have used Salesforce, don't get me wrong. Salesforce, very good product. Okay. Google Apps, very good, yeah. Yep. I do like them. I'm not, you know, I don't I don't say <laughs> don't go and do those things, yep. but I have done those things yep. and I've, I've ended up here. Yeah, yeah. I have not done a lot of Google or Salesforce stuff, but yeah, I think, I think they're also catching up. Google is trying to get some foothold in... AI world with their bar. Yeah, it, yeah. Hopefully still it good. doesn't answer the not as good. Yeah. Still good. Hopefully it, it answers the question in the right way next time when it is demoed publicly. But yeah, I think they are also catching up, and I think only future will tell us. Uh, I think we are good. And do we have any more questions? I think we're more constrained by time than questions. Oh, we have. <laughs> there's, there's loads actually. We might have to try yeah, and come back to these after. Have to come back to this. I can. Yeah. 
and we are we are you know as technologists in curve digital we do love we genuinely do love technology i've got an android and an, and an iphone i've got a linux machine a windows machine i've got a mac you know I, we, we we have all this we love technology we are consumed with technology we have just through experience ended up where we are based on when we've tried to do this before this has been the most effective way of doing this. all right guys last question and okay. i love this question as if if I, as a beginner, need to figure out how does Power Platform help me grow as a developer? Ooh, that's a great one. Um, I again, and this is this is my particular bias for this. Try it. Yes. Yeah. So you, you will love it if you have if you have some programming background. I think it it will be you know easier for you to pick up if you have done any ASP.NET MVC C sharp work. We do the same thing on Power Platform. We write a lot of JavaScript, TypeScript for our model-driven apps. We write a lot of you know C Sharp when we develop our plugins. So you are, you are covered there. Uh, but yeah, but Power Platform brings you some you know exposes you to some new flavors, right? A new way of writing apps when you write let's say Canvas apps, right? So yeah. it's, it's a little different, but I think it's not tough. It's made for citizen developers out there who are not you know pro coders. So it's easier. It might be, you know, the initial learning curve might be a little, little steeper, but I think eventually, you, you know, it will flatten out and you'll be able to add Power Platform as a, as a, you know, good skill set to your existing one. So I think that brings us to the end of it. I really thank everybody who joined us. And uh, uh, I would like to hand it to uh, Neha now. Neha, all over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shushan. So thank you all for joining this engaging and informative webinar. And uh, we really, I really appreciate the time and efforts of all the members. So I hope you find this webinar is to be valuable and gain some new insight and perspective on the Microsoft Power Platform. If you do have any question after this webinar, also you can ask by posting a question on our social media platform. And and we'll be happy to answer all of your questions over there as well. And I would request you to all please check our career pages to know about current openings. And I would also request you to connect on our LinkedIn pages to know about our upcoming events. So thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.